Hello, everybody, and welcome back to the Chiluminati Podcast, episode 180. 89, 189. <laughs> it was either 189 or 190. I wasn't sure which one. 189. We're not there yet, but we will get there, boys. We will get there. Uh, it'll happen faster than you think. As always, I'm one of your hosts, Mike Martin, joined by none other than, you know, the Jennifer Aniston and Gerard Butler of LA. What movie were they in together? The Bounty Hunter. I was about to say, it probably had a terrible name, like The Assassin's oh. Bride. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's, uh, it's a comedy. And of course, uh, of course, it's it's from the director of Hitch, which I did see. I saw Hitch. You saw Hitch is one of the movies you've seen. Wait, it's is Hitch the one where Will Smith's a superhero? No, no. That's Hancock. Oh, never That's mind. Hancock. That's but Hancock. Will Smith is in the movie. Hitch is the Shit. one. Hitch That's is the one with Kevin James where he where he like is like a relationship caddy. Oh, yeah. I did not see that movie. Are you a big Will Smith guy? No, I'm, I've seen a few of his movies. I've seen the big ones. Independence Day, Men in Black. Okay. All the alien-related movies that he's done. Surprisingly, all the alien-related yeah. movies even out. as a yeah. child. Uh, yeah. No, so who... Okay, but who's who? Who's, who's Jenny Aniston and who's G. Butler? Oh, please. G. Butler, who would go on to star in such movies as Game Over, was it? The video game <sighs> real-life one? <laughs> and, I can't remember. And Falcon is Down, whatever, whatever they're called. Angel oh, has like fallen. White House has fallen, or whatever it is. Yeah. Oh my God. Yeah. Did yeah, you know that yeah. there's a fourth of those coming out? Too fourth? many. Too many. I didn't know there were three of them. Yeah. There's four. You didn't. You didn't. You probably didn't I see. I thought Angel Olympus has, has fallen. fallen. Olympus has fallen, or whatever. Yeah. Right. Yeah, right. Right. Yeah. London yeah. has fallen. Also. And oh, wow. also Angel has fallen. What is which, what is Angel? Like from from Buffy the Vampire Slayer? <laughs> yeah. Uh, no, yeah. I don't. I don't know what Angel is. London checks out. Olympus is the the White House. Yeah, Angel. The hero becomes the fugitive. The hero becomes. But what the is the fugitive. angel in the title? Uh, I don't know. The uh, the president tries almost gets assassinated, or he does get assassinated. That's the plot He's of exonerated. all those movies. He gets, bl- he gets blamed for trying to kill the president. Probably. I can't really. I don't want to read this. <laughs> Why would they try to blame him after he saved the president? Actually, I feel like the president in the second one is different from the president in the first one. Morgan Freeman is in all of them. Wow. Right, but Morgan Freeman's the vice president in the first one. How do I know this? 3 a.m. one night on a weekend, I was like of course. sitting on my couch and it came on the sci fi channel and I watched through it commercials and all. That's how Ugh. it's not a good movie. You were Drew enraptured. You in. Yeah, man. Would you say it was, it's better than some of the movies we watched on Rotten Popcorn? Oh, for sure. Yeah. <laughs> Here's a sentence from the review of Angel Has Fallen, not the review, the Wikipedia page. Trumbull awakens from his coma and Kirby is revealed to be Jennings' secret co-conspirator planning to retaliate for Trumbull's attempted assassination Trumbull's by declaring by declaring Cold War II. Cold War II. I love that you can declare the Cold War, first of all, making it no longer cold. <laughs> if you just want to know how ridiculous the first movie is, the plot is North Koreans managed to infiltrate the White House by one, pretending they're on tour, and... Two, it's very, very easy. They they Classic get trick. a truck, and the truck has a machine gun in the truck, and they gun down the all the Secret Service agents because the Secret Service agents rush out to fight the guys in the truck, and they kill all the Secret Service agents but one. And Why that's the plot of the first that, movie. It sounds Why like somebody was like, was... "I love Mission Impossible." My turn. I just <laughs> can't they... figure out. Like I, they address it, they're like. It takes three minutes for all of the army to show up and save the president. By then, we'll control the White House. It's like three minutes, bro. Wow. That's isn't fast. it? Isn't I thought the movie was with Channing Tatum and Jamie Foxx. No. What the hell is that? Channing Tatum and what? Who? <laughs> I don't know. No, Olympus Has Fallen is is a different thing entirely. Olympus Has Fallen has Aaron Eckhart. Yeah, Aaron Eckhart's the president. You're, <laughs> I mean, I can see why you got it confused. They're in the movie White House Down. <laughs> Stop <laughs> it, dude. <laughs> well, of course they uh, are. In 2013, in this film, a divorced U.S. Capitol police officer attempts to rescue both his daughter and the president of the United States dude. when a destructive terrorist assault occurs in the White House. They're both. Starring Channing Tatum, Janie Fox, um, Maggie Gyllenhaal, Joey King, Jason They're Clark. Both the same. This James is like when they released. They're two from the same are, year, dude. This is like three months apart. This is like a, a Armageddon and Deep Impact. Yes. Oh my! Literally, I never. Yeah, I only ever saw Deep Impact. Capote and Infamous. Yeah. 
I remember that one. That's wild. That's hilarious. Dude. I'm Jennifer Aniston. Yeah, no, I was going to say Alex is 100% Jennifer. Aniston. Oh, yeah. Okay. Just so you guys know. Yeah. yeah. All right. Me. Fantastic. I am a shirtless Spartan warrior. Yeah. Yeah. You. <laughs> all this guy. That's how I think of you. We're going to have to watch Bounty Hunters one day on Rotten Popcorn. Where can they get that, Alex? Oh, man. If you want to watch something that good. I know it seems like it's impossible. I know it seems like you'd never that that you'd never be able to. But if you head over to patreon.com slash Pod, let me tell you something right now. You'll see. <laughs> You'll see. And not only will we be able to get access to rotten popcorn, and I mean all the rotten popcorn. We put out about one a month, but you, there's a lot more than that. Let me tell you. There's some weird ones. Do we uh which ones are out? Tom Hanks? Uh like what else? The did the did Pay the Ghost come out yet? Yeah, Pay the Ghost was the most recent one to go public. Good lord. Pay the go Ghost look up what that public. movie is. What did people think of Pay the Ghost? What was the what's the vibe on that? What do people uh, think the, of the, it? On the Discord, a lot of people were like, we need a Nick Cage marathon. Yeah. That's what we, I was getting into Discord. So yeah. I'm like, I'm down do. for that. I could do that, a Nick Cage marathon good. where he's trying to pay off his taxes. I would watch that. I would watch all he's good. Nick, Nick Cage. I'm not saying although, he's that good, although, but he also, you know, he did what he had to do to pay his bills. I respect yeah. that. I respect that. Just watched two Nick Cage movies over the weekend with Crendor, both truly terrible. Not like funny knowing? Nick Cage, like genuinely poorly made films. So was it knowing? You know, I got a whole catalog. Or no, what's the other one? Next? Did you see that one? Yeah. Uh, no? the ones that we watched were Humanity Bureau, which would be very good <laughs> for this podcast. Uh, Humanity Bureau. Humanity I like Bureau. the sound of that. And then there was, a, there was one called 211 that was one of the worst films I've ever seen in my entire Oof. life. Yeah. All right. Good times. <laughs> like one. Yeah. One of uh, Peter Falk's last movies was next. Check it out. Get your ad free episodes. Get your freaking mini sods that we're going to do like we're going to do one right after this. Get anything you want. Patreon.com slash Humanity Pod, the greatest website of all time ever made. Finally, completely, definitively. Here we are. Cool. Also, shout out to producer editor Dean, who's sick as hell right now. Hang in there, bud. Bless you, Dean. He uh, he auto tuned Jesse apparently in the last episode uh, to the Men in Black, and ev- I've gotten so many comments and so many tweets. Yes. That is like, please do that regularly. Please always auto tune Jesse. I don't know where in the video you do the Men in Black thing. I want to go find it, but people have just been loving it. So, uh, Dean, Dean is you can you can thank Dean for the auto tuning. Here come the Men in Black. <laughs> here's here's what I'm gonna tell you. Here's what I'm going to tell you. Don't listen to the fans every single time. Okay? Galaxy Defender. No, not every single time. Trust me on that. Yeah. Trust sometimes what the fans want and what they say they want are two different things. Let's put it that but way. But what the fans <laughs> want, you know what? Is a Jesse Cox. Oh, wicked wild. Wicked wicked wild wild west. <laughs> Jim West, Desperado, Rough Rider. No, you don't. I get <laughs> <laughs> Oh, I'm I'm excited to and hear any that. Any damsel too. that's in distress, be out of that dress when she meets Jim West. <laughs> Uh, all right, boys, are you ready to dive into something fun, something exciting, something mystical? Give it to me. Yeah. Because none of that is actually happening today. <laughs> it has been oh, okay. almost three months since our last true crime episode. <laughs> uh, Dahmer was where we last the last true crime, and that was at the beginning of November, November 11th. I, I love how you always bring up how long it's been so that the yep. people who are going to be mad at you yep. are they, like, I already yeah. got them covered. They won't <laughs> yeah. say anything now, obviously. Uh, but more, most importantly... Um, it's been even longer since we've done a true crime that wasn't serial killer focused. So today we're not going to be looking at a serial killer. Uh, we're not going to be looking at an individual who may have been like a black widow or any of that stuff. Today, we're going to do something we haven't done in a while and look at history and its horrible, horrible influence on us now. Wait, even what? Today. Back when we did MK Ultra, yeah. I talked about the preclude to MK Ultra, the things that led up to us having MK Ultra, and part of that, very briefly, is the uh, quick mention of Unit Seven Thirty One. And I said back then that we would cover that someday, and that is today. Today we are going to be covering Unit Seven Thirty One. It's very much uh, a, a kind of buckle in story. It's it's not a pleasant one. Um, in fact, the one the man who ran Unit Seven Thirty One, a man by the name of Shiro Ishii is basically considered the Japanese Joseph Mengele, which uh, we'll see why that's the case um, as we as we go through this. This will be a multi. If you don't know who that is, you can Google it. But let me tell you, not a not a good guy, not a good. No, dude. no, not a good guy. Maybe one day we'll also cover Mengele, but not for a long while. Um, Shiro Ishii, the difference between, uh, say, Mengele and Shiro Ishii is that Ishii didn't really get held responsible 
for all of the things that he did. And that's because he cut a deal with the United States. Thank you to Daily Harvest for sponsoring today's episode. And I don't know if you noticed, but it's 2023. Let that settle in, let your brain adjust. I, it's been a month of 2023 to really blow your mind. And at the start of every year, I always try to have the best intention, start that new year off with a fresh thought process. One of the big things I always go for is less screen time, especially this year. I'd love to be able to not be in front of my monitor all the dang time. And one that I definitely need to do now that I'm settled in Texas for almost two years, which is crazy, is eat better because while Texas food is really good, it's also really bad for you. Luckily, with eating better, I can at least check that off the list thanks to Daily Harvest. See, Daily Harvest delivers delicious harvest bowls, soups, flatbreads, snacks, smoothies, lattes, and a ton more. Built on organic fruits and vegetables, it works directly with farmers to source the best ingredients, freezes them at peak ripeness to lock in that flavor and nutrients, and they never use artificial preservatives or ingredients. With nourishing and easy to prep options, I never have to think twice about what I'm gonna be having for my next meal, snack, or dessert, and I know it's gonna be good for me. Way better than just spraying whipped cream into my mouth, which I've done. Everything stays fresh in my freezer until I'm ready to enjoy it and helping me reduce food waste. And my daily harvest shipment is just a couple days out and I can't wait to try it. Daily Harvest is committed to human and planetary health, which means they do their absolute best to ensure transparency and integrity when it comes to their ingredients and the humans who actually grow them. By supporting farmers who invest in practices that increase biodiversity and improve the health of our soil, and by delivering food in recyclable and compostable packaging where possible, Daily Harvest does the work and I can just eat guilt-free. It's a win-win. If eating well is a goal for your 2023, let Daily Harvest support you on the journey. Just give it a try. I promise you, you will feel so much better about yourself. Just go to dailyharvest.com slash chill to get up to $40 off of your first box. It's that simple. dailyharvest.com slash chill and you'll get $40 off of your first box. Just dailyharvest.com slash chill and you support the podcast as well. Thank you guys so much for sponsoring the episode and thank you guys for listening. I'm gonna go have some a delicious flatbread. And that's because he cut a deal with the United States. And we'll talk about that as we come to the end of the series and why he escaped. But we'll also learn that karma still kind of got him anyway. And he got a ending that I think is relatively fit for a man who was about to live a very peaceful, calm life in the United States. But uh, I want to shout out before we begin any of this, the multitude of sources that I uh, am using for this. Um, first and foremost, uh, a shout out to a paper written at the School of Graduate Studies of East Tennessee State University by Gregory Dean Byrd, all about General Ishishiro, his life and what led him to Unit 731, as well as two separate books, uh, Ishishiro, Yosef Mengele of the East, which is going to be the primary source of today's episode. Um, but the other book that we're going to be dabbling in as well, but is not going to be the primary source, is simply called Unit 731. Uh, and it has a bunch of survival stories, the people who lived through it and had firsthand accounts of what they did, as well as firsthand accounts from some of the basically call them the Japanese S uh, equivalent of SS officers. They're special police who would go in and grab people and take them off the streets. Um, Jesse, I think. I'm curious, do you know much about yet? Yeah, I'd just like to ask, do you know much about Unit 731 prior to us diving into I this? I seem to recall, I mean, yes, absolutely yes now. But if you were to ask me whenever we first talked about this. Yeah, that was MK Ultra. I seem to recall being kind of like, mm, I know something, but not, I mean, I know a lot yeah. now. Um, I would say yeah, yeah. to everyone out there, if you're interested in learning more and you want to Google it, just be careful. Yes. because. While a lot of the things that are out there are kind of like diagrams of things, every once in a while you'll stumble upon an actual real ass photo, and yeah. it is some pretty disturbing stuff. So if you're not it's, ready to handle that, yeah. Yeah. don't don't look it up. Yeah, it's uh just for this whole series, and I'll make sure I regurgitate it every episode. Just a trigger warning of just like be cautious warning. Uh, this episode, while we're, there's some definite terrible shit we're gonna be talking about. This episode is much more about uh, Shi uh, Ishishiro himself and his life leading up to Unit 731. It'll be the next couple of episodes that get, you know, kind of rough to listen to. But it's important because what the U.S. did with that information, you know, we again, we talked a little bit about it in MKUltra. Uh, we're going to go into much more depth uh, in, in, the, in the final part of this series. Uh, I'm excited to finally cover it. I think this is a fascinating topic generally. 
Um, and not a lot of people know about Unit 731 as a whole. Uh, Alex, did you know anything about Unit 731 prior to this, the show or anything? I am going to choose to use the, you know, metaphor of the iceberg that people yeah. love to use on the internet. Sure. And I will tell you that I'm aware of it, its place on the atrocities committed by s- states against its people. Uh, you know, secret government project iceberg. But it's I I you this may surprise you. I typically don't dig deep into these types of things because the details are what just absolutely horrify me. Yeah, agreed. And just it, so I will enlighten you of those horrifying details, uh, whether you like it or not. Thank you. Uh, Damn. You're welcome. All right. But in order to understand even Ishishiro's path to success, we have to briefly and quickly look at the Japanese history with biological weapons as a whole and the core of their ultranationalism that drove them kind of in the direction that we ended, they ended up going in the uh, 20s and 30s and 40s. It, obviously, the use of biological weapons have predated World War II. The World War II is the kind of the war that made them very more common knowledge, I think. Uh, history shows that diseases had been well used, with examples including Anatolian War from 1320 to 1318 BC, where the Romans and the Persians were regularly poisoning their enemy wells, and the Mongols disposing of diseased corpus- corpses in towns they need to conquer. There are stories out there of them literally catapulting diseased bodies over walls, so that when they would hit the ground, they would ex- fucking just explode gore everywhere, because they knew that that spread disease they didn't maybe they can you imagine having that idea signing off on that i I, yeah that's like a heinous idea but like the reason why you would do that is when you think about it like tactically a battle is happening or your own soldiers have died or you've killed their soldiers what are you gonna do take the time to bury them no you're gonna if you keep them around they're gonna get your people sick so screw it let's launch them back at them yeah like it makes sound sense I it's get just it. disgusting and awful yeah it's gross it. as hell like i can't imagine living there during an attack of just in bodies just fucking blowing up in the street and, and there's a lot off. of there's a, especially in you know the middle ages there was a lot of ways that if you were not like hyper religious at the time you could use that against people like a great example is if you're if you're like 11th century christian you're gonna be like, we have to bury these bodies so that when Judgment Day comes, they can be resurrected. But it's like, bro, if we leave these bodies around, we're, we're all gonna dead. need to be resurrected. Yeah. yeah. So, so you'd have to convince people to burn bodies, but they'd be like, no, if we do that. And so, you know, invading hordes would just use that against them. Like, okay, we'll just throw bodies at them. It it's crazy. Uh, I think the more recent, or at least the more common example that a lot of people are still taught in schools, at least they were taught when I was still in high school is uh, obviously the British and American soldiers that gave Native Americans blankets contaminated with smallpox. Sure. Like, that's just straight up biological warfare. Like, just the most core version of it. Uh, And as the U.S. began to continue its expansion over the years, it began to try to show off its power on a more international stage. And the reason we know what we're about to talk about uh, of Japan is because of, uh, in 1851, a man by the name of Matthew Perry went into Japanese (laughs) waters with a squadron of Navy ships. Oh, Perry. Uh, authorized by President Miller to fill more and force Japan to open up trade with the West. So they just forced the J- Japan to trade with them. And Japan at that time was a feudalistic country with not really advanced technology. Uh, but when they, from trading with us, they found a way to industrialize even with the small amount of resources that they had. So very quickly, Japan and was- And then the last samurai. And that's, and then Tom, Tom Cruise. Cruise and- I don't even, I never even seen that movie, but I do know Tom Cruise. Is I in it. unabashedly love Last Samurai. I don't give a shit. It's great. It's, it's, look, it's a really well made movie. I can't speak to the cultural sensitivity of the movie. I'm not Japanese. I don't know. I'm going to doubt that it's made with a lot of reverence and truth for history, but it's a pretty damn like quality. But culturally, movie. from what I've heard, is that it's like beloved in Japan as a film. Oh, really? Oh, wow. All that's right, what that's I heard. Cool. But I, I have honestly, that's just what I heard. It could be, well, you know, all right, people in Japan, let us know. Yeah, please. let us know. Um, but this is all very important as the industrialization of uh, industrialization of Japan began happening. They needed more resources and they started to have territorial disputes with Manchuria and Korea. Uh, the negotiations ended up breaking down and then Japan ended up attacking Russia in Port Arthur, which then led to the Russo Japanese war of that time. And, it's here that we learned that the Japanese quickly adapted 
to biological warfare very specifically. It, uh, that's when Japan realized that diseases could be as, eas uh, as deadly as firepower, and Japanese soldiers were suffering from cholera, beriberi, typhoid fever, diarrheal diseases, and anywhere between 25,000 and 80,000 men in the Third Army were sent during the siege of Port Arthur. So they were just losing people left and right to just all kinds of, of sicknesses. Were you about to say something, Jesse? I, I Just to clarify for anyone listening, the way to understand this is, um, you know how, like, as Americans, especially like white Americans, the push west conquering America mm -hmm. was manifest, manifest destiny. destiny. And the reasoning why is because literal God wanted us to take over this land from these savages so that it yep. might be brought into the fold of our glorious, beautiful, like white ass nation, right? Yep. Now take that. That is roughly Japan, except not white guys. Yep. The Japanese mindset was very similar to America's and like all of like Korea, the mainland. Ultra nationalists. We are better than yeah. them. We are bringing them our culture to make them on our like it's it's it was a thing at the time, right? It's that it's that time period of the world. Even now, there's parties in Japan that are very isolationist and very anti foreign. Yeah. 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 We're seeing a rise of that kind of idea all around the all around the world these past. But I mean, where? that's what led up. That's what led up to World where, War One. Where, where? Is like. Yeah, all these people got in their head that their country was the best country and taking other countries and then all the problems. That, and then like it gets bigger and bigger and bigger and more of a mess. And then, you know, a dude shoots another dude world like all that. Yeah, it explodes. literally. And that's it. And so, yeah, in this case, just think America and how we treated uh, ev like all the native people here. Just import that into China. Uh, sorry, import that into Japan. And then that is how they saw all of their neighbors. Very similar. And they probably yep. got hyped up by us. Let's not lie. When Americans yeah. went there and started training with them and were like, oh, yeah, they definitely got we fast forwarded yeah. their tech, like getting trade relations with us fast forwarded their technology. So, so, so rapidly. Yeah, and the and the bring and the English as well. And because they yeah. didn't have to put money, especially post World War Two, because they didn't have oh, to yeah, put yeah, yeah. money into a military because we were their military for a while. It yeah. all went to tech and they became even more tech popular. And then in the eighties happened and America was like, Oh no, <laughs> everything's made in Japan. It's like, yeah, well, we, that's what I mean, they really shot ahead of us. Like, yeah. They, yeah. I read really something did. about, they have like divergent evolution in technology in Japan, which is kind of interesting about how their cell oh, phones are. Again, when they don't have to spend an entire fortune for decades on a military, like you have, you have all this extra money, money to do. Cool yeah. shit. Yeah. Yeah. I vibe uh, with that. Yeah. Well, at this particular point, they were dying by like like huge numbers just to diseases. And that in that, Japan responded by establishing their first epidemic prevention lab. And because of that, by the beginning of the 20th century, Japanese scientists were well known for their work in preventative medicine. Similar to their efforts toward industrialization, the Japanese scientists worked hard and discovered the cause of beriberi and dysentery. Like they figured out what was the reason. The Shiga uh, bacillus, a strain of bacteria which causes dysentery, was named after the scientists who freaking discovered mm. the thing. Uh, in response to the Russian, Russians poisoning wells in Manchuria with typhoid, dysentery, and cholera, the Japanese ended up developing a portable water testing kit. Like, think about the time period they're in and the, the kind of cool shit they're coming up with even in the 1850s, like late 1850s. Like, port, like a portable water testing kit is crazy to think about. Uh, it ended up being there in order to treat the ingestion problem during wartime, and each soldier was given a, a creosote pill after a meal. In a short period of time, Japan made a great deal of progress in the field of preventative medicine comparable to the mm -hmm. West. Like, they blitzed past, past us in terms of their understanding of just uh, bacteria and, and shit. It's nuts. After about 10 years after the uh, Russo-Japanese War, the German army's use of chemical weapons inflicted heavy civilian casualties in World War I. And consequently, on June 17th... Mustard gas. Yeah, yeah, that's yeah, exactly. That's when mustard gas was created and used in mass, dude. Yo, if uh, you ever... Uh, I'm not saying go get exposed to that, because that sucks. But if you ever want to know what it was really like, there are videos, I think you can probably find them on YouTube, of oh, soldiers. Sure. I believe there's, like, part of your training now in the army is they stick your ass in a room and, like, you get exposed to gas. 
And you can it watch sucks. them get violently sick, yeah. and then they put on a gas mask and they're fine. But like for a good minute, they're uh, they're coughing and their eyes are watering. They look like they're gonna die, yep. and it does not look bad. pleasant. Do not. I don't and want. That's any how they of that. were fucking killing people yep. in World War One. It yeah. was so bad that on June seventeenth of nineteen twenty five, forty four countries passed an agreement at the nineteen twenty five Conference on Disarmament in Geneva and signed an international protocol named quote. The protocol for the prohibition of the use and wharf of asphyxiating uh, poisonous or other gases and of bac bacteriological international protocol methods of warfare, quote unquote, the Geneva Protocol. <laughs> and here's the thing. Geneva protocols, conventions, all that's great. As long as you practice like. Honest warfare and you like yep. engage in civility rather than tit for tat escalation where it's like, F it, I'm going to just go crazy. And that it goes against human nature. That's why still to this day you have people who are like, oh, I think it was Gaddafi or someone like used chemical. They still be doing it. We just say, yeah. please don't. It's bad. But it's very bad. Turns out please some people don't. are just awful. And so, you know. Yeah. Uh, and all this again, like this, this unique path that Japan took at this time of being like the number one in research in terms of all these diseases. You see why what's about to happen kind of happens. Uh so during this agreement uh, that the 44 nations signed, Japan was also there. Their representatives were at the conference. They were involved in the drafting and of the signing of the protocol, um, although it was not ratified in Japan at the time. And after World War One ended, although Japan did join the League of Nations, as we all know, the League of Nations was a wonderful group Woodrow and Wilson's absolutely baby. served their the League. Of yeah, Nations. yeah, and it worked super well. <laughs> they were the only great power in Asia to join the League of Nations, and Japanese officials still felt as if the West was not treating them equally. And due to the lack of industrial needs after the war, Japan was experiencing the worst economic crisis in its history. Some describe this time period in the 1920s as a chronic depression. No, to give more context, Japan during this time period, the late 1800s into the 1900s, the reason why there th it wasn't just about like, we're better than everyone else. The reason that they really stuck with this idea is because they watched China, a much bigger, like much like, you know, it's a huge country with a lot of power. They watched it collapse under the influence of Western countries. Like when we all yeah. we sphere of influenced our way into that shit and they watched it be taken over by Western interests. And they were like, all right, we need to modernize so that they can't mess with us. We need to be aggressive. So none of our neighbors, which are controlled by the enemy, can mess with us and now we need resources because we're running out of stuff on the islands so we got to go take it from those other countries and screw those guys they aren't they don't even like control themselves so like why should we care like it was that level of and honestly on that i can easily segue to the next point which is like so they start sliding into their ninth in their depression to the 1920s obviously by the 1930s the world was now experiencing a depression yep. And what did America do to make it better for them? Nothing. Instead, we imposed tariffs on Japanese goods through the Smoot-Hawley Tariff Act. Oh, this is straight up history. I'm here for this. Yeah, yep. I told you. And this this of just reinforced that nationalism in Japan because the West is fucking them over even more, even if they did try to avoid it. Um, they're, they now are experiencing even more economic turmoil. Political groups that promised to fix things became more prominent. Does this sound familiar? And two of those groups were the Black Dragon Society yo, and the Cherry Blossom yo, Society, which is like yo. the two opposite. And I loved it. I loved that. That sounds like a Yakuza game. The Cherry Blossom Society specifically, their membership ended up growing very quickly with the focus on ultra nationalism. Members were military, education and military uh, and media fields. A notable figure was General Araki Sadao, appointed army minister in 1931 who was a strong advocate for the Kadoha policy, which is, quote, the imperial way. So an imperialist at heart. It advocated expansionism, totalitarianism, and a huge military. The Board of Information censored the media information, which conflicted with the army at this time. And in the same time period, education became radicalized. Again, does this sound familiar to certain things that are trying to what, be what taken care to of say? today? Whoa, what are you oh, trying oh, to I'm say? Sorry. Oh, I'm sorry, I got to keep going. Where? Uh, what? Where? Scholarships no longer went to students solely for good grades or hard work, but to students who personified the Imperial Japanese Army's ideals of discipline, tradition, strength, and above all else, 
loyalty to the emperor. Oh, are you talking about Guillermo del Toro's Pinocchio? I am. Yeah, I am. Okay. That's a, uh, it's not April yet, but I thought early April fools could be a real fun time. Yeah. Uh, April Fools. This is about Pinocchio. You got me good. Gotcha. Uh, yeah, I'm here. For, you know, I'm glad. Uh, that's the end of the show, everybody. He guessed it too early. Patreon.com slash uh, Chimani Pod. We'll see you guys later. Bye. <laughs> uh, history books were then retroactively revised and thoughts from quote unquote dangerous thoughts from the West, which contradicted the army's ways were considered a crime. Uh, war on wokeness. Anybody? Sorry. What? Uh, what? <laughs> Where? Where? Sorry. What? Where? What? <laughs> Uh, with the newfound ultranationalism, the Imperial Japan Army staged an incident in Manchuria to simultaneously take territory and then, at that moment, quit the League of Nations. And that's like the, the quick crunch down history of their kind of path to resist uh, joining the League of Nations and saying none. And then immediately when it no longer suited them, less than 10 years later, they just jumped out and we be, they begin their they restart their interest in. Uh, biological warfare. Sorry, Jesse. And ahead. this is one of those, uh, just, just like for historical sake, for everyone listening, what's fascinating is I think, you know, when we're younger and we're learning about World War II, for example, it always, I always found it interesting that students would be like, okay, Germany and Italy, I get as Axis powers. They're like kind of neighbors. But why Japan? And the thing that's interesting is I think is the thing you see today. Um, and, you know, I'm not sure where in the world, but, you know, you see it today. Where? Strong men <laughs> love strong men. Dudes who are like totalitarian mindset, authoritarian, love other people who are the exact same way. And they like feed off each other and they give each other ideas. And so despite Japan being on the other side of the world from Germany, it doesn't matter if you're like in that mindset. Oh, this guy gets me. This dude, this guy run the country. We're basically the same. And it doesn't matter if your plan is 20 years from now to take them over too. You don't care. But at the moment, they're an ally because they t they treat their citizens the same way. And you're on the same page when it comes to like how to handle stuff. And so that's why they can be allies during this time period rather than just like one group is doing a thing and one group is doing a thing. It, it makes more sense that way. It's like, oh, we're trying to yeah. expand. Oh, you're trying to expand and you hate them too. Hey, buddy, if you want more detail on the uh, relationship with Japan and uh, their development of uh, the epidemic responses and bacterial responses in that time, uh, the book uh, Unit 731 has a much broader uh, coverage of that kind of thing. So much so that a lot of the reason we became so uh, clean in the military is because we sent somebody over there in the 1850s and they saw all of the sanitization things that they were doing and the amount of uh, lives they were no longer losing prior. And there's a whole like the, uh, the the general they sent over, he wrote a whole thing about what he saw and how impressed he was. And it really did dent all, how we did things here in the West, in the US. Um, it's really, really fascinating. But beyond that, the focus of today's episode is a man by the name of Ishishiro. This would be the man who would run Unit 731 and have such a dominant presence within the medical uh, world of Japan that he, anybody who was sent to a hospital or worked as a doctor in a hospital was usually considered to be within the Ishii network. We'll talk about that as, it, as we go into it. At the very question, beginning, though, question. Ishi, please. When please, you say yes. Ishii network, just, just for my own clarity, is that is, is Ishii his first? Oh boy, it's hard to do. This is such a Western way they to look at it. They go back and forth. It depends on what you're reading. Some people I see Ishi Shiro and then other ones I see Shiro. Ishii. I wonder if because it's the Ishi network, maybe Shiro's the last name. Yeah, I believe because Ishi I'm sorry, Ishi's the last name. If it's the Ishi network, maybe Ishi's the last name. Ishi, I think, is his first name because his father named him Ishi for being the fourth boy. Ah, uh, okay. And I think Shiro all right, all right. is the last name. I mean, but look, it's I've a different culture, him, so uh, you know. Yeah. If I'm getting it wrong, please let me yeah, know. I, I did I my know. best. I did That's a lot of reading yeah, as yeah. best I could. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and much like about as people compare this man to Mangala, uh, Ish Ishishiro was also born, much like Mangala, into a very wealthy family. Uh, on June 25th, 1892, he would be born in the village of Chiyoda Mura, a farming village in the Kamo district, uh, Chibe prefecture, and southeast of Tokyo. His family was very wealthy and was the community's largest landowner. And his relatives exercised feudal dominance over all of the local people. I looked this up. I had to look this up. It was going to drive me crazy. Thank you. His daughter's name 
was Harumi Ishii. So Ishii is 100% Okay, Ishii. so Ishii must be, it must be carryover his last name then. Which so, is, then okay. so technically if we were going to do it the English way, it'd be Shiro Ishii, but like... Unlike Mangala though, for Ishii, we do not know much about his childhood or early teens. Like it's all kind of just vague and a mystery and no, it's not like a lot of record of what he did. Mm. What we do know is he then ended up, uh, he did grow up. People saw him kind of as like, this tall, thin guy with glasses who was kind of weird in school. And he had a what they considered a scholarly look that contradicted his rather powerful and apparently annoying as fuck personality. He was the fourth son of an established family, and it's assumed that he attended primary and secondary school. But again, we do not know. Mm. Ishii was uh, gifted with a photographic memory as well. This would serve him through his entire life. But is that real? Is that actually real? It is real. My mom actually is uh, has a decently photographic memory, though it's gotten worse as she's aged. Yeah, uh, she would say like back in school, uh, she wouldn't study because if she needed an answer to a question, she could close her eyes and open up the page and read what was on the page. Shut up! And I'm just like, I love. She that. went to college fuck? at she went to college at sixteen. Like it so was like jealous. she just like rocketed, making me feel I just like I wish I had Jesse that. over here. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> I just like that sounds like magic to me, man. I'm like, that doesn't that's, that's not fair. I wish I could do that. Uh, but Ishii, yeah, he was he had a photographic memory. It allowed him to excel in his schoolwork to the point where he would be labeled a potential genius. Uh, his love for Japan and emperor also was endless. He was an ultra nationalist. His appearance would command respect to the people around him. He stood at six feet tall and was well above the height of the ja average Japanese male. And he took pride in his appearance, well-groomed with a commanding voice, though there are stories that in private, he looked entirely different and was an absolute slob behind the scenes. He joined the military at a very early age, and it was during his service that he began to realize that he had a passion not for being in the military, but for medicine specifically. And in that moment, in, that mil in the military, as his passion was realized, he had a new main goal for life. And that was to develop a career as a doctor in the Imperial Japanese Army. And on April, in, rather in April of 1916, Ishishiro would be admitted to the medical department of Kyoto Imperial University. So he's going to medical school in 1916. Um, and he was very ambitious. Uh, and because of his ambition and the method of betrayal that he ends up using to impress his superiors, which we'll get to, his fellow students fucking hated him. Ishii would work in the lab. So like what I mean by betrayal is like in the lab after he would go work in the lab well after other students had left and cleaned up all of their equipment and he would use their equipment for his experiments and leave everything out. And so when he finished, he would neglect any and all cleanup after himself, which meant the following morning as the classmates came in, they saw all their shit out and it just prolonged their work. Uh, Ishishiro then at the age of 35, would receive his PhD in microbiology from Kyoto Imperial University, one of the top schools in the world at the time, the equal of any Ivy League school out so, here so in the So the US. vibe I'm getting is... Spoiled kind, brat. Yeah, kind of, but on the level of... Remember that there was like a kid that was being roasted online a while ago because uh, there was a video of him throwing trash on the ground in a school, and he was like, well, it's the janitor's job to pick it up. Like, that's the same vibe that i get from this dude yeah, yeah where he's 100%. like yeah these Absolutely, other lesser students the they can vibe. clean it i'm experimenting I think that kid i think that kid was uh steven miller by the way just say so you no know. <laughs> <laughs> you might be right you might be right uh it's funny too because also similarly to mangala his family particularly his child has such like fond things to say of her father that the things that he was being accused of just couldn't be proper that he was unjustly condemned, that her father was a warm hearted person, so bright that sometimes people couldn't catch up to the speed of his own thinking, which she admitted made him irritated and it caused him to shout every so often. Um, but it's 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 fascinating the different personalities he has. And it's that serial killer almost mentality of you present yourself as a you know normal loving father. But when you have the freedom to be who you want to be, to do the things that you truly want to do, uh, you become the monster that you are. Uh, in school, prior to his graduation, in another weird like red flag of this man, in his studies, Ishii often would grow bacteria as pets in multiple God. Petri dishes. 
Yeah, and his odd practice of raising bacteria as companions rather than as research uh, made him notable to the staff in the university. Uh, they, they, like, he was just like, that one's kind of weird, actually. Maybe just keep your eye on, on that guy. Uh, yeah, I don't, like, making friends with Petri dishes screams sociopath. Like, what are you doing? Like, right. you can't make friends with actual other people, and so you, and I imagine in print, this thing that you have total control over and it becomes, you know, your best friend. He is just a very, very bizarre dude. Uh, and, and like I said, I think you're right in that he um, ended up just kind of being that kind of guy who would throw trash on the ground. Uh, I'm all messed up now because Alex said Stephen Miller, and all I can think about is like, if that guy had the power and ability, oh, no. he'd, I guarantee he'd be doing some of this shit. I'm, I've never yeah. been more convinced of anything yes. in my 100%. life. Yeah. His medical career began, began very quickly after graduation in 1921. Ishii was commissioned into the, into the Imperial Japanese Army as a military surgeon with the rank of Army Surgeon, second class, which is Surgeon Lieutenant. Uh, and in 1922, Ishii was assigned to the First Army Hospital and Army Medical School in Tokyo, where his work impressed his superiors enough to enable him to return to Kyoto Imperial University to pursue a postgraduate medical schooling in 1924. So he went, you know, for even further medication, uh, education at that point. Uh, it's it's during that second trip where he started growing petri pets and calling them um, his friends. It's very weird. One of his mentors, Professor Ren Kimura, recalled that Ishii had an odd habit of doing his laboratory work in the middle of the night, uh, which is when he would use all of his, you know, friends' gear. So it wasn't that people weren't noting what he was doing, but nobody, for whatever reason, fucking stopped him. In Kyoto during 1927, Ishishiro had a decisive revelation. He was following his regular routine of looking through stacks of research journals in order to keep up with the latest discoveries in his field. While browsing through a medical journal, he found an article on the Geneva Convention of 1925, which Japan had signed, but the Diet had not ratified, which uh, I don't know what that means in legal terms. I never looked it up, but it just didn't ratify in Japan. Does that mean it just never became law in Japan, I imagine? Um, the books that I read never explained Ratified it. Ratified means it was never, yeah, legitimized. So it just never became legitimate in Japan then, uh, which I guess it doesn't because they leave the League of Nations anyway. So I don't know why it mattered either way. Regardless, that was the treaty that banned use of biological warfare, as we mentioned previously. And the reason Japan had not ratified the treaty is it recognized the potential for this field in modern warfare. It was during his time at Kyoto University that both the Japanese army and navy both became impressed with the theoretical concepts of biological warfare that were now being drawn up by Ishishiro. Like, when I mean revelation, the man immediately started leaping into developing and devising plans of bioweapons. Like, that's not a normal thing to be doing when you're in your, like, late 20s. It's like, I have an idea. Instead of bettering the world, I can't wait to kill what, thousands. What year was this? What time period was this? 1927-ish, right I now. mean, it is kind of post chemical warfare and if you're obsessed yeah. with experimentation and you now know that you can kill people with like weird diseases and things i yeah. guess this is i guess you can get down this path it's a dark path to be down but i get it i don't know i i, I guess like i can see the th i can i guess i could see how it got there but it's just like i if you're a man that genius it sucks that you're also evil Look, um, because imagine what he could have done. For Sherlock, we have to have a Moriarty. Let's just not, you know, that's I, what it I is. Guess. What it is. It's just this Moriarty was a monster. They all are. Ishii at this point had designed this new division so thoroughly, every detail was accounted for, including availability of test subjects in Manchuria. He was already looking at human testing this fucking early in his life. Ishii saw prisoners as completely subhuman and expandable. Uh, expendable. I mean, if you're looking at your fellow classmates as less than, yeah. you're going to look at prisoners as even worse. The problem is with this particular thought is that not only was he the one that thought that, but so did the Japanese military after World War I. They no longer, like prisoners were nothing to them. One reason Japan refused to ratify the Geneva Convention was that it felt no Japanese soldier would allow himself to be captured. Therefore, the code of death before dishonor was placed deep in Japanese soldiers' minds. Japan was not willing to take the burden of caring for prisoners of war upon themselves, especially if its own men would not be in the same situation. Again, that ultra-naturalist, we're better than fucking everybody, we'll never be captured, we cannot be stopped. 
our emperor is a god. How could there we ever be There is some tradition stopped? there also of like shame and, you know, your your family's lineage and all that being marked by the shame of your surrender and giving up and that kind of thing. It's better just to kill yourself rather than like let everyone. So like there is tradition there, but boom, mm-hmm. that's that's a no good. Yeah. Is a no good is right. Uh, and so the Japanese decided to invade Manchuria. But in the invasion, Japan decided to call it not an invasion. It was an incident. Mm. And since they weren't waging war, they didn't need to abide by any international law regarding the treatment of any Chinese prisoners of war they may have taken from that Manchurian incident. See, it's all legal. It's fine. The Japanese army claiming Chinese forces had destroyed the railway at Lake Liu, which is uh, a lie, by the way, that didn't happen, near Mukden, invaded the northeast of China. And Japanese soldiers poured across the border from Korea. The Chinese army had superior numbers of men, but due to the speed and tenacity of the Japanese forces, they were very quickly defeated. This started the Japanese occupation of Manchuria in 1931. This area of China would remain under the control of Japan for the next 14 years. The Japanese themselves, to provide a pretext for the invasion, had actually staged the attack. Ishii used this situation, of course, to his advantage, pleading with top commanders to create a germ warfare research division. In 1928, Ishishiro left Japan for two years, traveled throughout Europe and the United States to see what other countries were doing in the field of biological warfare. And he used his discoveries from his travels to convince anyone who opposed his ideas of the need for Japan's national security. Like, it's the same argument used today. They're doing it, so we have to do it now, because if they do it and we don't, they can beat us. It's it's, it's like the whole idea with nukes, you know, like that. This is the nukes of, you know, back in 1920s and, and whatnot. This is the easiest and quickest way to kill entire towns, entire swaths of people. The Japanese program was conducted with the approval of highly placed military and civilian members of the Japanese wartime government. It is apparent that uh, Hirohito, obviously the emperor, knew of the work that Unit 731 was going to be doing in Manchuria. Uh, The author then writes, quote, detailed directives of the imperial headquarters that the army chief of staff issued to the Kwantung Army Command in charge of biological warfare were as a rule shown to the emperor and army orders of the army division of the imperial headquarters on which such directives were based were always read by him. There was no way that basically there was no way the emperor did not know what was about to happen. He could not claim ignorance from this. Uh, Ishishiro had a virtually no restrictions and he had no need or desire to work with others in the Japanese army medical department. He's going full on like mad serial killer mode with all the power and backing of his government. He acted as if he had no fear of offending his superiors by his actions, and due to his egocentricities, he wanted to earn all the glory and advancement for himself, and he was not willing to share it with fucking anyone. Only him. One of his main supporters, uh, one of the main supporters of Ishii in his work, was a man by the name of Colonel Chikahiko Koizumi. And in 1930, a scientist at the Tokyo Army Medical College uh, during World War I, Koizumi had distinguished himself as a military officer, physician, and a biochemist. Quote, during World War I, Japan did not use chemical weapons, but it did conduct research into chemical warfare and the design of gas masks beginning in 1915, he says. So they were looking at that shit even well before this, like well, well before this. Koizumi had led this chemical warfare research beginning in May of 1918. Unfortunately, he was involved in a laboratory accident that almost killed him when he was caught without a gas mask in a chlorine gas cloud. God. <laughs> he was just like, yeah, just chl- chlorine himself. <laughs> so like, what an idiot. After his full recovery, he continued his work with new enthusiasm. He headed up the chemical warfare program from 1918 to 1922, and the Japanese were trying to build a first-class navy, and money was in short supply at this point. The problem he faced was the low priority that his superiors were placing on his chemical weapons at the time. So he was receiving very little, if any, funding and the things he wanted to do. He just didn't have the money to do it. But that's kind of where uh, Ishishiro comes in. While at Tokyo Army Medical College, Koizumi met Ishii and found him to be an extremely intelligent young man. Quote, his talents for biomedical research as proved through his published scientific papers and his drive to make Japan the foremost nation in biological warfare was the same vision shared by Koizumi. 
Koizumi had influential friends that proved to be very important in the rise of Ishii in the coming years, especially within the military, such as Hideki Tojo, a future prime minister of Japan. And Ishii and Koizumi used these contacts to gather support for their biological warfare project from within the scientific circles of academia and hospital research groups. It basically, it's not what you know, it's who you know. Like, he just, he, they all, because they were born, he was born rich, got all of the things like that no one else was getting a chance to see, going to great colleges and mingling with people that were, you know, in another, in another world would never talk to him. Because he has those, the access to that, he can just push his idea of where money should go. And people were, again, you have to understand, this man is in Japan at, at 19, in like the, the 1930s, a six foot tall, very imposing, well-dressed individual who was extremely egocentric. And that held a lot to people. Like people were very intimidated simply by him being there. Uh, his presence was just a very commanding that one. That is so wild that there was like a time when that was like what you could do. So, re so recent. I know. Oh, yeah. 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 That's the other thing, too, right? Like, this isn't that long ago. Like, some people might have some, like, great grandparents that were alive during this. Like, my great grandmother was alive during this, and she only passed away, like, right. a year ago. It's, it's crazy. It's not far from what we're doing, like, today. It's just back the other, the other way. Uh, by the mid-1930s, Japan was manufacturing enormous quantities of poison gas bombs, including shells of chlorine, phosgene, and mustard gas, everybody's favorite. Koizumi was made the dean of the Tokyo Army Medical College, and in 1934, he became the Army Surgeon General, and in 1936, he was appointed as Japan's Minister of Health. And remember, this man is buddy-buddy with Ishii. As Koizumi moved up the ranks, he made sure that Ishii was promoted along with him, and after Ishii uh, achieved the rank of Major at the age of 37, Ishii was appointed Chair of the newly developed Department of Immunology at Tokyo Army Medical College, which is it's like the origin story of a genuine super villain. villain. He's, he's like he's gonna yeah. pair up with fucking air hypnosis dude. Like it's like, like good god, it's just pure evilly. For obviously, immunology was the field that dealt with microbiology, pathology, vaccine research, and for this reason, it was the perfect field for a man like Ishii to freaking study because everything he always fucking wanted. And Koizumi quickly granted Ishii the resources that he needed to initiate building a biological warfare program for the Japanese army. So they schmoozed their way to the top and, and just money flowed. They just diverted the money flow. The new appointment as chair of this department gave Ishii the power needed to become the head of the biological warfare unit that he had been requesting the army to develop. Major Ishii had a full schedule that began with early morning lecture, lectures to students. In the afternoon, he dealt with administrative matters, quote, while covertly researching biological warfare in the evening hours in the lab space of the immunology department that had been allotted to him. Daniel Barenblatt, author of A Plague Upon Humanity, also noted that, quote, here Ishii and a small team of scientists and laboratory assistants worked to culture, uh, to culture lethal bacteria and to develop chemical poisons. Um, he, Ishii was also studying, and I think we've talked about this in a pre previous episode, uh, that he was studying flea transmitted bubonic plague, cholera, typhoid, as well as anthrax. And those early def experiments for, uh, were for defense against diseases and did not involve human beings. It wasn't until Ishii's unit developed vaccines to protect the Japanese soldiers from research that, uh, from disease outbreaks that humans started coming into play. Um, I, and I think there was a plot in World War II, maybe? That would involve releasing fleas with diseases on the West. It sounds like exactly the type of thing that would happen in World War II. Like, I know there was all kinds like like a cat with a bomb or, you know, like stuff like that. The, the author of the book, uh, the book that we're using, Hal Gold, lays out the development of the chemical and biological weapons by Japan in, in the World War I in parallels to other great Western powers. The main difference during World War II between the Japanese program and our program, the Allies program, was just the willingness of the Japanese to use the weapons and conduct experiments on live human beings. The Allies refused to use human subjects on the grounds that it was not ethical. We only started doing that after World War II. And Gold's book is filled with facts given by former Japanese military per personnel and victims' testimonies, which we'll, as I said earlier, be talking about in the next episode. But just as a taste to what we're going to be uh, broaching, uh, that there's that. Uh, again, it's just one of those things where, like, the dude just glided into place. Nothing stopped him. Everything about his, his mentality, Japan first, was just the perfect, 
he was like the perfect evil dude at right. the perfect time to be evil. And he got everything he could ever want without really trying. Well, all it takes is one person to say a thing a lot of other people are thinking. And if that person's willing to do it, then all those other sure. people are like, yeah, okay. And that's a, like, that's how you get up in those, like bad people get up into positions of power is they, they say and do things that other people don't have the will to do because it's wrong, right? Like they deep down know it's wrong, but they want it. Yeah. But they know it's wrong. So there's always some person that's like, I'll do it. I don't give a, I don't give a shit. And that's what that's kind of the vibe here. Like this guy is just a bad dude. And I mean, just in general, like across the board. Yeah. Like just not a good person. Like even in personal life stuff. Yeah, exactly. And, and it's just it's ah, there's, people like Isho, uh, Shiro Ishii just they infuriate because they lived that. It's almost like they get off on that double life. They very much like love living their true monster self and then being like, see, I'm a family man and I just blend in. They like get off on that shit. I don't think um, I don't want to like get into psychology, but I feel like they may not even think that. I think they are. My job is my job and I'm not doing anything that I, I'm being paid to. And then I go home to my family and I live my life. I think they're just sociopaths, man. I think there's just yeah. a group of people that just I mean, yeah, they can do this without feeling empathy or emotions for others. Yeah. I agree. Um, even at this point in time in history, too, uh, Unit 731 Damn. is now up and running. It finished its construction in 1931, though Ishii isn't there yet. Uh, and it is where they are occupying Manchuria. He's not even there yet. And they already have that. So I'm saying, like, they have a thing. No. You know they want it. No. They just need a guy who's willing to be like, screw them rules. And they found him. Yeah. And they're... Unit 731, while it may have been the central building in operation, we will also learn of the many satellite camps that they had that they were just simply referred to as death camps. Japan had their own concentration camps. They were doing literally exactly what the Nazis were doing. But yeah, the big, the the big museum instead. for all this, though, is in China. If you want to see like the actual where hmm. they're putting all the artifacts, it's in China. I don't know where it is, but I know it's in China. Yeah. Uh, there's also, you know, theories and they're pretty solid theories that uh, the U.S. also knew what was going on and knew exactly how things were, were going down for years. But because of how we made a deal with him at the end, it's one of those like, oh, we don't. What are you talking about? I don't know what you're I don't know what you're talking about. Are you trying? Hold on. Whoa, buddy. Are you trying to say that this country uh, turns an eye? When it comes to like other countries no. and their weird, like messed up shit they do to each other. No. And, 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 and it's, it's. No. How do we get to the moon, by the way? I'm forgetting. It's almost <sighs> like you're also trying to say that, like, because their skin color wasn't white, that we cared even less. It's almost like. Ah, come on. It's almost like you're trying to we say all sorts of America. things about this country. Where, what, where are you talking about? America. <laughs> what is bro. this? <laughs> yeah. This sounds like. Uh, a fake like a book written about alternate history United that's not States, us okay we would never do anything like the world like that. we live in today yeah uh yeah you know what no, Call no, me when no, no, everything's no, no, taco no, 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 no. bell okay <laughs> you we're definitely not gonna read a a quote next time uh from the head of uh the oss at the time lamenting that they wouldn't do human testing in the u.s and how much of a pain it was that didn't let them you know, that wouldn't we're not going to read a quote about that. Don't worry. What's about crazy that. is from that, like messed up standpoint where ends justify the means. All the messed yep. up things Germany did and Japan did and like all these torturous messed up things at the end. Most people in that sort of ends justify the means they are like they achieved a lot. And we know a lot about the human body because of that and space flight because of that, like but so many people do. Like, yeah, you can't again, ignore what shit, it though. was. But that's what after the war, that's kind of the vibe we had, which is like, that's, get me those scientists because yeah. they know what's up. It's like, bro, we what? Did it, we did it so much. So much. So much. That's the thing. That's the thing, right? We have like we literally did like and the funny thing is this. This guy wasn't part of Operation Paperclip in totally tired and separate deal from the deals that they were making with the Nazis. The deals they made with Shiro were not part of that. This was a different program. And that's that's what's messed up. That's how they sold them on it. The idea of certainly I did bad things, but those bad things taught me all of this. Most of the medical knowledge we had 
in the 60s, 70s, 80s came from the terrible, terrible things that happened in World War II. And like, like Werner. Yeah, Werner von Braun. Yeah, he yeah, dude. is the reason we like we would have gotten to the moon regardless. But we were now jumping directly into a Cold War with Russia. And they, we, America was like shortcuts at any cost. But that's because in, in, in their mind, it was like, this is for the fate of the planet. So any means are justified, which yeah. I think is. Again, this goes back to when you were talking about I wish there was some thinking about that right now in terms of the literal planet. Uh, but <laughs> that goes back again to when you were talking about Geneva and just the idea, like if someone believes something enough that they're willing to do anything, making all the rules in the world don't matter because they're going to justify it by saying I can lie, cheat and steal because it's for the good of the world or I can kill all these people because it's for the good of my like. That's peacemaker. Yeah, that's crazy talk. Yeah. That's crazy talk. Yeah, it's 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 God. It's, it's infuriating. Well, we got to. It is <laughs> just because we can. But just, that's history, just, man. Like if you want to get into history, that's what it is. It's oh, people yeah. justifying terrible things literally over and over and over again just because it's like we're doing it for us. Like it, you know, if you really want to get like messed up, you can talk about Japan. You can talk about. America, you about any country in the world, any country has mm -hmm. a history of built on bodies like that's like, let's just that's what it is. Yeah. All it takes is a man like this to have the reverse thought of a good person. Like, seriously, yeah. like because we look at, uh, you know, kind of re rewinding just slightly. Uh, Ishii, obviously, while he was researching in Kyoto, uh, he was uh, at some point dispatched to go help cure an epidemic that had broken out in the in a region of Japan. And it was during that work that he had he kind of had the thought of like, why not call? Why? Why not? called this silent enemy a silent ally instead. He saw the the havoc it was wreaking across this thing that he was sent to cure, and he was just like, I'm going to kill people with this. This is what I'm going to kill thousands of people with. And when he came back to Kyoto, and he brought it up to uh, uh, a guy by the name of Araki Sadao, who would eventually be tried for all of this shit, um, he, was, he was just like, hmm, no, I like your ambition. I'll, he signed a paper, and bam, he immediately was just like allowed to he had free reign. Uh, what's important about Manchuria, which we're going to talk about a little bit, too, is that uh, Manchuria had a railway system that the Japanese operated nerve center of the growing Manchurian economy uh, within which Japan had been developing a commercial and industrial base since 1904. So they already had a kind of uh, infrastructure there that they were using, and it made it way easier for them to transport mm. people back and forth. Um, you can read a lot about that in a book called Terry's Guide to the Japanese Empire. I only got used the clips that I needed and did not bother reading the book. So I don't know if it's any good or not. Um, but as time went on and Japan continued expanding the breadth and depth of its power in the Asian mainland, Shira's career continued to advance. In 1932, an, uh, the Epidemic Prevention Research Laboratory was set up within the Army, uh, within the Army Hospital of Tokyo with Ishii in charge, which would mean uh, Unit 731 has now been operational for approximately a year without Ishii. The title of the laboratory was a, as a euphemistic as Manzuguo's Independence and the Great East Asian Co-Prosperity co Sphere, uh, under which Japan conquered neighboring countries. That is <laughs> some like, hard 1984 shit. That is. Yeah, Great East Asian Co-Prosperity <laughs> co Sphere. Never, if there was like the internet at this time, everybody would have been like, what? <laughs> like, you know what I mean? <laughs> Uh, just given a terribly mundane or like lightweight sounding name to conquering neighboring countries. So like we're the co-prosperity sphere. Hey, we're going to kill you. Get I out mean, of the way. Admittedly, that's a tactic used even today Still in like today. Congress yeah. when they name a bill and it's something oh, yeah. long and boring. And so people don't ask so nobody questions, looks at right? It. You're yeah. like, mm, I don't want to deal with that. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, at this time, prevention of disease in the Japanese military was still an objective of research, but the center of gravity had now shifted to the development of bacteriological and chemical methods of warfare. This laboratory was Ishii's first major step in that direction. Meanwhile, Japanese ascendancy in Manchuria was bringing the Japanese medical community closer to unprecedented opportunities for research because of the human victims that they were using. Mm -hmm. Ishii's goal of turning bacteria and gas into weapons of the Imperial Japanese Army would require comprehensive research, and animal research had serious limits in producing usable data. Growing control by Japan over Manchuria would provide research materials in the form of human beings who would just be plucked from the streets like lab rats. 
Toward the end of 1932, Ishii applied to the army to be sent to Manchuria to expand his research facilities. Then, the following year, Ishii's aggressive push for biological warfare research resulted in a grant of land and a building in Tokyo expressly for him to research. Coincidentally, this was also the year in which Japan withdrew from the League of Nations, which had judged it in the wrong for its aggression against China. Uh, so, you know, they just said bad, bad, and Japan just was like, okay, we're out. Not like they were following the goddamn law. It's anyway. not a good look to leave the League of Nations. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know what I mean? When there's a body yeah. called the League of Nations, it's, there's no way that's a good, good thing to do to leave the League of Nations. But this, this severance of what little ties they were maintaining to the League of Nations at this point was instrumental in freeing up Japan's hands from any remaining constraints or guilt they may be feeling as the way they began behaving in Asia. The Japanese maintained control in Manchuria in a variety of ways. Emperor Puyi's police force, obedient to the commands of his Japanese puppeteers, was one law enforcement arm. In addition, there was a special police force which engaged in intelligence work but was also skilled in gaining confessions from suspected spies. You think that's code speak for torture, torture. Very good at getting people to con confess because they just beat the fuck out of them. But that wasn't the scariest kind of cop you could bump into in the Japanese empire. Those belonged to an elite group of military police known as Kempai Tai. Substantial, though Japanese capacity to main maintain public order was, there was no lack of work for it. Opportunities to detain people constantly manifested themselves. The powers that were in Manchuria decreed anti-Japanese activity a cause for arrest, and the oppressive nature of the Japanese occupation created uh, patriots who formed underground groups to oppose it. Just always remember that. Much like in Nazi Germany, too. We always look at Japan and you know Nazi Germany as in that time as evil, evil, evil. But there were good people that were under like working underground who knew what was going on was wrong and knew they had an uphill battle and were revolting and rebelling anyway. They were badasses and, and stories of heroes we'll probably never ever get to know of those attempting to slow down the horrors that they saw happening. It wasn't, you know, it's not like this great swath you can paint the entire country with. Uh, I just think that's very important because I don't think we never, I never got, I never got taught that kind of thing in high school. It was always just like, you know, the basic shit and never really the about- The most it would be taught is, is the resistance in France, for example. Yeah, mm -hmm. but yeah, true. But yeah, not yeah, a lot yeah. of people like it wasn't until, but maybe it's just because information wise we didn't know, but it wasn't until much later that we learned yeah. that there was multiple, like people were trying to kill Hitler, like that kind of thing. Yeah, all like the his own time. officers were like, this guy. So, you know, you have to just assume yeah. there's a lot of stories out there of like decent people that were not going to tolerate this shit. Things. But yeah. then again, you have to think like a lot well, of the population was like, well, I'm not going to get killed, so what do I care? Like that, you know, it's a dark, like, where would you be on that timeline, right? When you think about that, would you risk your yeah. life? I, that's such a good, yeah. I mean, like you, you could be like, yeah, of course I am. But in the moment, would you? Yeah, that's a tough question to ask of anybody. It's hard because yeah, there's no preparation. You don't get to say goodbye to people. You know, you get taken and that's it. Like, what do you do? Uh, it's, 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 you know, even after there, any official resistance stopped, Groups and individuals continued the, the struggle long after all of that had, had ceased, giving the Japanese an excuse to use them as research materials as well through all of the years of experiments that ended up happening. Some members of the resistance were captured inter and interrogated by these elite uh, police forces, the Ken Pai Tai, then sent to the experimental labs afterward. Members of that police force were under orders of the army and were specially selected for their rigid, oppressive, and unyielding personalities. Basically, much like the SS, in order to be one of these guys, you had to be a complete monster at heart with no qualms about kidnapping people in the middle of the night, taking them off the streets, shooting them there if you have to. They were given jobs uh, such as catching spies and interrogating suspects and were authorized to use torture if they were so inclined. So, yeah, you know, only the best people were part of that police force. <laughs> right. <laughs> like, Jesus Christ. Uh, these people, like, were trained in how to just stare people down, how to use the voice to intimidate a suspect. People from an earlier era sometimes mentioned the fearsome way that these, quote unquote, protectors of Japanese aims could shake a person with words, but even their descriptions failed to do justice to the reality of them. There is nothing romanticizing like, this is not romanticizing or exaggeration. 
the testimonies recorded in the book that we're going to use in the next episode from former Ken Pai Tai officers, one of which was an 80 year old that came out and told his pe the people I am a war criminal. And for more than 30 minutes, he like spoke about everything he did, why he did it for the country, for the emperor and how they were all kind of commanded to go to death with the secrets of what they'd done. That, that one, at least one in his old age just was able to just actually put out the truth. And that's why we know. Um, the Ken Patai served as human material procurement for Unit 731 and its associated outfits. And a former officer from Dalian, Mio Yutaka, tells how the prisoners were handled, saying, quote, We were the special handling forces of the Ken Patai, in charge of taking prisoners for the experiments of 731. We knew the prisoners would be used in experiments and not come back. We tied them with ropes around their waists and their hands behind their backs. They couldn't move. We took them by train in a closed car. Then the Unit 731 truck would meet us at the station. It was a strange truck, black with no windows, a strange looking vehicle. So, you know, it's, it's, it's the exact same shit that the Nazis were doing in concentration camps. It's the literal same exact thing. The gloomy sealed freight cars uh, to which Maru was referring ran over the tracks of the South Manchuria Railway. They represented a much different side to the efficient railroad from the one that had impressed uh, Officer Terry, the guy who uh, went to go visit Japan way back in the day. But that is where we're going to stop, I think, episode one. Very, as now very we're moving into Parallel nation. And, yeah. yeah. Next episode, we see Ishii within this year, 1930, uh, 1933, step into his role as the commander of Unit 731, the experiments that would take place and the wide amount of influence he had on Japanese medicine at the time, a real true control over it in a way that I think not a lot of people understand uh, and how they looked and treated everybody as non-humans that were their enemy. It's a fascinating story, but that is where we're gonna leave it at the, at the buildup of who Ishii is and where he's coming from and why this story, I think, is important in terms of a biological warfare. We'll be back next week, everybody, with uh, part two of Unit 731. Thank you guys so much for the support. We're off to go do mini sode over at Chiluminati Pod, or patreon.com slash Chiluminati Pod. I don't know what the boys have this time, but uh, I think the boys know what I'm bringing to the table. No clue. As I texted it to you. Nope, didn't read it. <laughs> <laughs> that's fine, that's fine. Um, thank you guys so much for listening. We'll see you next time. Bye-bye. Bye. Patreon, -bye. Bye. 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 Welcome back to the Illuminati Podcast. As always, I'm one of your hosts, Mike Martin, joined by the... I don't know who they are. There's two. One. Terrence Hill and Bud Spencer. No. Neo and Trinity. No. I don't understand, and I probably never will. Let me just tell you right now that there's two... Leon Kennedy and Claire Redfield. I'm telling you, I think he literally just looked up famous duos. Cheech and Chong. And it's been going through the list ever since. I'm trying to dig deep. Which one of you is, uh, Dick Powell? Me? Your name's Jesse Cox! <laughs> I want to lose an idea. I want my mind vanished. I want to lose an idea. I want my mind Welcome back to the Illuminati Podcast. As always, I'm one of your hosts, Mike Martin, joined by Alex and Jesse.